so I'm not sure if a couple of you guys got the Theo Harris chapter. I had assigned it because I think that it's probably one of the best um, historical narratives on black high school student activism during the black power era, uh, principally because Theo Harris looks at the ways in which high school student activism became this community building project. So it was something that the community could organize around. Um, but she also argues that looking at high school student activism gives us a view into the direction of the black freedom struggle. Um, so I would definitely recommend that you check out her book, um, her chapter. It's called Walkout. Um, and it's actually about the 1968 high school student walkout in LA. And she looks at the collaboration between um, Chicano students and black high school students. And I don't know if you guys have seen the movie. I think it was called Walkout. I think it was an HBO movie. Um, but when you get a chance, I would definitely recommend that you check out this video as well as Jean Theo Harris's chapter. Now, how many of you guys have been paying attention to the news and have noticed the Newark student takeover of uh, Cami Anderson's office, the superintendent of Newark? No? OK. Wow. OK. I'm sorry? OK, yeah. So um, let's see. This is the next one. I'll go back here. So over the past 10 years, a number of cities have witnessed high school student walkouts and building takeovers. We can talk about Colorado. Um, we can talk about LA. We can talk about um, DC. We can talk about Detroit. I think there was even one in Iowa, right? So that students um, have definitely been walking out in mass over high stakes testing, right? In 2006, LA students walked out in demand of students who don't have documents, so undocumented students, to have access to LA's educational institutions. So that this is a phenomenon that's occurring at an increasing rate, um, and probably this is the most that we've seen since the 1960s and 1970s. Um, I began studying this topic because I was once one of those students. Uh, around 2004, 2005, I was a high school student in uh, Washington, D.C. public schools. And I just remember thinking, why do I attend a school that's five blocks away from the White House, from the nation's capital? And we have paint peeling off of the walls. Um, we have bricks falling on students. And we have to sit in our jackets and coats in the wintertime because it's so cold, we didn't have heat. So I thought about these experiences. Um, and it, it encouraged me to go to college to study African-American studies. I was interested in African-American history and culture. Um, I was interested in seeing if there had existed an activist tradition. I'm sorry. Um, okay. I was interested in seeing if there was an activist tradition, anything similar like what I had done when I was in high school, leading walkouts, leading marches at the US Supreme Court, um, thinking about questions around quality public education, thinking about um, the role of the ROTC in schools. And so there were a set of experiences that I had that led me to this work. And I'm telling you this story because I want you guys to understand the biases that I bring to this work. This is a class called Interpreting the 1960s. And so understanding that historians bring a set of experiences to our work in the way that we interpret our sources. Um, so I definitely just wanted to share that with you. After I um, went to college and I noticed that a lot of the history was about clergymen, it was about ministers um, leading the civil rights movement, I didn't see myself in, in that narrative. And so I took the opportunity to study this history for my undergraduate thesis. And it was really just an effort to see, OK, were there students who had organized in earlier periods of American history. And I found that there were, right? That there were young people who had organized in the 1950s, before Brown. That there were young people that had organized in the 1960s and the 1970s. But I didn't hear about this in high school. I didn't hear about this in undergrad, in an African American studies program. So I said, OK, clearly there is some work that needs to be done here. So I wrote my um, undergraduate thesis on that topic. 
And it was really an effort to give voice to historical characters in looking for myself in the work. So I went to um, graduate school, and my professor said, yeah, that's not enough. You're going to become a historian. You need to think about these questions more critically. You need to think about this history more critically. It's not just about yourself. It's not just about giving agency and giving voice to these characters, because they had voice and they had agency. You have to do more than that. So then I said, well, what are some of the research methods that can help me push this narrative a bit in a, in a better direction, in a more useful direction? So then I took a research methods class and I learned about oral history. Before I took this class, I thought oral history was simply two old people just sitting down, having a conversation about days gone by. And I had no interest <laughs> in that whatsoever. I mean, at this point, I'm 21, 22, right? So not thinking about the fact that oral history is a way that we have been able to preserve African American history. That it is something that is deeply rooted in how we think about historical narratives. So, and this is not to minimize um, how young people think about history. I think that we are trained in a certain way in K through 12 to think about history where we're disconnected from it. So, I learned how to do oral history. Um, I use the MA thesis as a way to think about what oral histories can tell us about um, high school student activism. So I interviewed eight individuals who were former high school student activists, three women, five men. Um, these individuals were a part of the Black Student United Front, which was the student arm of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. How many people have heard of the League? Detroit. Um, Detroit was one of the major places where Southern migrants went after World War II, right? It was the promise of a job with a living wage and better education, uh, better educational institutions. Um, you had people who migrated from Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. So most of the families in Detroit have Southern roots um, in these states. So I, um, I mean, essentially I argue that the character of high school student activism in Detroit had its roots in these experiences. Um, Detroit witnessed one of the largest explosions in its black migrant history, 611 percent. Um, let me see if I can pull up. Here we go. So as you can see here, this is the inner city of Detroit. The outer limit includes Highland Park. Hamtramck, Dearborn at the bottom. Uh, this is the racial demographics of Detroit in 1950, according to the 1950 census. The darker areas are where you have the highest concentration of African Americans. So this is immediately after World War II. So you get the 1960s. Um, as you can see, it gets a little bit more chocolate, a little, little bit more darker. Um, a part of this is attributed to the fact that factories moved out of the city, attributed to the fact that um, automation became the way to produce cars. It, was, it wasn't really based on having the assembly, li assembly line as much as it had been in previous years. And then this is the era, closer to the era um, that I focus on, where Detroit is essentially Chocolate City. We can also call D.C. Chocolate City, where I'm from, but we'll call uh, Detroit Chocolate City. While migrants came to the city in hopes of finding better jobs, um, jobs that were better than the southern sharecropping system, they ended up in the most dangerous and dirtiest jobs, right, working in the auto factories. By the 1950s, the city's auto industry would place Detroit on an economic downturn, largely because of the industry's move towards automation and outsourcing. Additionally, Detroit's Educational institutions faced a financial crisis that derived from two causes, the in-migration, the explosion of blacks, and the out-migration of whites. And so this put a huge burden on the educational system. According to the Detroit Urban League, black children attended the oldest schools in the oldest parts of the city. The school curriculum tracked black students into the factories. Before there was the school to prison pipeline in Detroit, there was the school to factory pipeline. And what I mean by that is that they typically uh, provided, they typically put, 
see, thank you. Um, black students on the general track, which was a curriculum that prepared you for vocational education. Whereas white students, they put them on the college preparatory track to provide them with the skills to attend Wayne State University um, in Michigan, Michigan State and University of Michigan. And even though there were apprenticeship programs offered to students um, in hopes that they would be able to access union jobs, labor unions worked to keep black students out of union controlled apprenticeship programs. But the rebellion of 1967 gave radical activists a foot into the mechanisms of educational and political um, institutions. What do you guys know about the riot, what we call the riot of 1967, but some of us call it the rebellion. We can talk about that. Um, and I mean, and just in terms of the, the National Guards coming in, one of the interesting things I found with the oral history interview, I had one, I call them narrators instead of interviewees. I think it's just a little bit more active that they have um, much more of an active role in the research. So one of my narrators, I asked her about the riots, and she said, I just remember that they stockpiled weapons in my elementary school. I just remember seeing tanks roll down the streets um, of my neighborhood. And at that point, she was about 10 years old, right? So that these experiences with the rebellion, or what we call the riot, um, these experiences shape young people's ideas about politics and protest. It shaped their ideas about space, right? They began to think of it in terms of colonization, that this had become an increasingly black space, and yet you have the National Guard occupying our communities and our neighborhoods. So I, I have a script, but I also like to go with the flow of the conversation. So if you guys could just be patient with me as I try to find a place for us to kind of continue with with the flow. So the 1968 election for the Board of Education expanded the political possibilities for Detroit's black electorate, including its black radical community. As Detroit's black population continued to grow, black politicians gained more power, including State Senator Coleman A. Young, as did the Detroit Federation of Teachers. As the white population continued to move to the outer limits of the city, few white liberals uh, stayed and continued to invest in the city's future. Collectively, white liberals, black civil rights groups, and the Detroit Federation of Teachers formed the Liberal Labor Black Coalition. In time, these groups came to largely um, disagree over the forms of school governance. Would they fight to decentralize the school board? Or would they aim for community control of schools, right? And so what we mean by decentralized school boards, would the city continue to just have one central school board which would dictate the hiring and firing of personnel that would determine funding patterns um, and that would essentially dictate what the curriculum would look like? So that was school decentralization. Um, radical groups wanted community control over funding and the hiring and firing of teachers and administrators. The difference between decentralization and community control is that decentralization allowed room for uh, black majorities to have to be under the control of whites who had been elected to the regional board, whereas community control of schools allowed local organizations, local groups to determine the nature of the curriculum, to determine what their teaching force would look like. But more, so more moderate organizations wanted to rein in the authority of the central bureaucracy to grant more authority to principals and to form citizen advisory councils for each of the schools in Detroit. Today I really want to discuss with you the sources um, that will help me locate these students within, um, within this conversation, within this debate over whether or not the school system would become decentralized or if they would um, look to community control of schools. The first source I really want to talk about um, is an article that discusses um, student views about decentralizing the schools. And a lot of this was uh, based on their experiences within Detroit's communities. And I'll pass this around. It's kind of light, but I think if you guys can at least see the headline and some of the quotes in bold. Let's see, thank you. So students essentially when they thought about the decentral decentralization debate, they thought about their experiences within their communities. The fact that they had to run from the bus stop 
right, if they attended a school that was not within their neighborhood. The fact that they had to run away from um, white mobs that did not want them in their schools, that did not want them in their neighborhoods. This gives a personal face to the story around school decentralization and desegregation. What had initially been about policies, about numbers, I think the articles and the oral history interviews that it was much bigger than that for the students. It was really a question of safety, safety and survival. So I'm going to play audio from one of my interviews. This was an interview with Cass Ford. Um, she grew up in Highland Park, which was a suburb of Detroit, but after Highland Park's teachers went on strike, she still wanted to go to school. She was kind of a do-gooder. So she decided that she wanted to go to Detroit Public Schools. She ended up going to Cooley High School, which was in a neighborhood that was what, in what they would call transition. So it was a predominantly white neighborhood. Um, its high school was predominantly white, but they had students, um, they had black students who had started to attend the school as a way to integrate the school. It was very few black students. And so what you'll hear now is her experiences with transitioning from Highland Park to Detroit Public Schools, um, principally Cooley High School. How did you attend Highland Park Schools your entire no, uh, after the ninth grade at the high school, uh, the next year, um, when I got ready, but we had moved, me and my parents, my mother married, and she married my stepfather, and we moved, and she married early, and that, she, they ended up moving that, that year into 12th Street. And what happened was out on park when I started, because I was still going to go to home park school, because my grandmother was there, and I've been there, you know, all my life. But, when Okay, yeah, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Okay. So I decided to go to Cooley, which was where everybody was going. In that area, that was where you had to go. You were being busted at that time. So you had to catch the bus. They weren't picking you up. They had to go out of corner and catch the bus. Then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to Cooley High School. And then they had to go to uh, white flight was going on, um, and the, the teachers didn't want you there, the community didn't want you there, and it was a biggest struggle. It was probably the most thing that affected me, you know, in my life was that situation because when I went there, it was a couple things that happened to me. Number one, because of the education when I got at Holland Park in the ninth grade, I wasn't in class with 10th graders. I was in class with 11th graders. Because everything they had in the 10th grade, which is when I think high school started in Detroit schools, I had in ninth grade. So I didn't really get to know the people that was in my class. I got to know the people that was in the class ahead of me. And going into the, those classrooms and those teachers, I had things said to me. I was like, what did she just say? And I would go home and try to tell my mom, and she's like, I don't believe you. I said, this is happening to me. You know, what did you say? You don't believe it. This is what this teacher said, you know. Uh, the first day of class, I think they asked the students, you know, what is it you wanted to be? And some of the black kids were talking about what they wanted to be. And she said, bless you. Okay, I don't even know she said. Black people were Negroes. Can't be nothing but a Negro in the shoes. I was like, no, she didn't. You know, and then even when we got out of school, we had to run to catch the bus, to get on the bus, because you had this group, Donald Lobster and his group, a band of people that came together in a van that would grab the kids and, and beat them up. You know, they get out of the thing with slings and belts and things, gave you after death number one, you know, and then they was trying to grab kids. So we was all running to catch the bus. So as a result of that, we really started trying to stick together. You know, when we got there, you know, okay, we're going to go together to the bathroom. You know, we're going to go together after school. We're going to meet, and then we all going to run to catch the bus. I remember one time running up on these people's porch that was across the street from the school. You know, you had a school, and then right across the street were all these homes. Running out there on these people's porches, knocking on them. These folks never did come to the door. Never did come to the door. So then we learned you can't do that. You either got to run into a business, you know, and hope that they call somebody, or you got to catch that bus exactly when it comes. You know, so that, that was frightening. Wow. It was frightening. And, and I, I <laughs> when all that was going on, I realized they didn't want black students out there. They didn't want them in the community. The, the white people was leaving as quick as they could to move out of that area. The teachers were angry at us for even coming there, you know. And then, so I began to, to try to fight that. I just, I began to say, you know what? <laughs> I gotta survive, 
you know, and, and then the rest of the students, you get concerned for everybody because you realize that something can happen, everybody can get hurt. And we started really sticking together. And that's kind of how, how I got involved in the front because the front was at Harlem Park the year I left, but I really wasn't that involved. And I was like, oh, okay. I so what's know. the front? The Black Student Union Front. Okay. You know, they were at Harlem Park and Terry and uh, uh, Linda. So here she starts to talk about other students, but I would love to talk more about the oral history interviews. For me, conducting the interviews was the most profound part of doing this research. I love being in the archives, and I'll pass around some of the, the student papers that I found and some of the reports that I found, and we can talk about that. Um, but for me, I think that the oral histories give a face to a lot of the, the politics behind educational reform, particularly during this time, and the fact that the students had something to say, and the fact that they talked about these things in the literature that they produced, that they tried to make this, um, this debate accessible to their peers, that they wanted students to think about, okay, this is called Public Act 244. What does that mean for our daily lives, right? How do we connect policy to what's happening to us every day? Um, so I, I'm actually running out of, town, to, out of time. Um, what I'm going to do is pass around a couple of the, um, the student papers I found. One is a comic book. This is a comic book. Um, this is the introduction to a report that the um, High School Study Commission put together after students walked out of Northern High School in 1966 looking for solutions. Um, this is one of the student papers. They would actually write their own papers and mem um, using mimeograph machines provided by the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. And this is another one from Northern High School. Um, and I guess I should give a trigger warning. So they definitely use profane language. And I'll say this much about that. When I was in high school, you could not get me to read anything more than a page that was not fiction. So they tried to make it um, accessible to the students. They tried to make it interesting so the students would go, wow, did you see what they just said? But that they're learning about decentralization at the same time. So I'll go ahead and pass these out and I definitely look forward to, uh, to your questions and, and talking about what this tells us about high school students and, and their notions of citizenship, the fact that they didn't believe they had to wait until they were 18, until they had access to the vote to actually create change, to actually have, to actually determine for themselves what their future would look like. Thank you. If you guys have questions about what these folks did after they graduated from high school, definitely let me know. Cass, she um, actually went into the factories and organized in the factories, right? So she took the skills that she had acquired from organizing with the Black City United Front and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, which was a labor group, and she went and she organized women, right? So that women began to become a part of the union and went into the factories at an increasing rate during the 70s. So what she learned as a high school student, she took with her and became a labor activist. There's an article by Valerie Yao called Do I Like Them Too Much? I like my narrators too much. Um, but because I had taken a methods course, I, um, it gave me time before I started the interviews to think about ways to acknowledge the bias that I had and to actually think critically about what they're telling me. So that means that I had to ask some questions about sexism. If I read a paper, I had to ask some questions about homophobia, right? So, and, and at times that was difficult for me because I attended a program that really celebrated the black power movement. And it wasn't until later we started to think about the complexities embedded in social movements, right? that movements, you know, they aren't perfect, that people fight, that, that people um, don't always treat women well, right? So I think for me that was probably the most difficult part. But again, the interviews, it was the most rewarding part. Yeah, I, w I mean, er early on more so, I think as I, um, I learned to build a rapport with the activists, right? So that means I, um, I'd call them, I'd visit them, I talk to them, and I think the more comfortable they became with me, the more likely they, would be, they were to be open and transparent and reflective, like, man, we shouldn't have called ROTC kids cockroaches. Like, you know what I mean? So they definitely said that. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, I mean, it was a process. So they 
were a part of an incredible radical community in Detroit that had its roots in migration. Um, some of these kids study with Reverend Albert Clegg, who was a black Christian nationalist, was the founder of the Shrine of the Black Madonna. Um, some of these kids learned from Grace Lee Boggs. Um, they talked a lot about community, right, so that you had what they would call community mothers. There was Mama Odom, who she noticed that two of the boys um, had started to fool around a little bit, get in trouble, and so she put them in contact with General Gordon Baker, who was uh, one of the founders of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, and she said, here, do something with these boys, right? Keep them out of trouble, because at this point, you're also dealing with um, the influx of drugs within the community, and the kids actually wrote about this, right, so that, you know, how do we deal with this in our communities? Um, so they definitely had a sense of community. They'd also have political education classes with the League, right? So they're reading a Car Cabral. They're learning about Pan-Africanism. Um, they're thinking about Marxism and Leninism, right? They're thinking about third world systems. So they were a part of an intellectual community, I would say, that celebrated African-American uh, culture and history. And it gave them a world view that they've definitely carried with them throughout life. And I think that was because of the community they had. That what the students did understand was that education was incredibly important. They understood that they were being tracked in the high schools to work in the auto factories. They understood that they were not being prepared to go to college. They wanted to go to college, right? Um, so that education then and now is deeply embedded in African American notions of liberation and freedom. In Detroit, Detroit actually had one of the best models of American public schooling in the early 20th century. Like other urban areas wanted to emulate their model. Why? Because it, they had a great Americanization program for immigrants. Right, so yes, immigrants went into the factories, but they had access to union jobs. Sometime in the, after the migration, African Americans, in the, African Americans were used as strike breakers. The AFL, which is the American Federation of Labor, um, wasn't all that friendly, right? So that, that determines what kind of jobs you get, right? So that even if you're a white person in the factory, you at least have an opportunity to become a manager, right? You have an opportunity to manage the shop floor. So while they were being trained to go into the factories, it's for very different jobs that paid you know, a better wage and better working conditions. Uh, does that answer your? Yeah. Okay. So your second question, which was, remember? About memory. Memory, right. So there's a thing called symbolic truth, right? So there is a possibility that they remember things differently for a number of reasons. In oral history, um, there's a concept called reticence. I mean, it's a typical word, but the way it's thought of in oral history is that sometimes people don't discuss certain topics or they discuss them in a certain way because it's either painful or because it doesn't fit their narrative, right? So for me, I had to think about the fact that these are people who were well-read, right? Like they're writing these like four or five page mimeographs about Marxism, Leninism, um, they understand decentralization. So they are also well aware of the narrative around black power. So that they have this urge to make sure that it's not, um, that I don't demonize it, right? Because that is the image, that it was the bad brother to the civil rights movement. So I definitely took those things into consideration. Oral history isn't the only method, right? I'm in the archives. I'm talking to other people. I'm looking at crime statistics, right? So as historians, we use different sources to interpret this history, and oral history is just one of them. Um, I mean, these kids were definitely well aware of what was happening across the globe. They when they thought about citizenship, they thought about global citizenship, right? They, um, they, one of their papers, um, the headline is, Black Youth, the World is Yours to Take, the World, right? So they had an understanding of what was happening in Paris. Um, they had an understanding of, of what was happening in terms of um, young people in South Africa. Um, and that a lot of the, the places in third world countries, a lot of the organizations from third world countries would message or um, send the League of Revolutionary Black Workers um, mail requesting that they send them their letters, their writing, their literature that they've been producing. So that there was definitely 
this international um, solidarity that I think the students saw themselves a part of. Yeah, um, I mean, the when I started this project, it was definitely a political project. But as I went to grad school, they tamed me. <sighs> I'm tamed a little. Um, but the now the way I think about it is the purpose of the work isn't to say, okay, this is what they did, this is what we need to do. It's to think about context. It's to think about timing and, and using certain strategies and tools within a specific moment. So that's how I think about the work. I look at how they use certain tactics when, um, and when I talk to, um, when I've given this talk before, I always get people who say, well, kids these days, and I'm just like, who's <sighs> Because what I learned from this work is that y young people had access to a community that believed in them, right? That understood that they had tools that they could bring to the table. So for example, um, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, their relationship to the, BS, to the Black Student United Front was one of mutual benefit. So you have the League, which tries to leaflet um, in front of the school, in front of the factories, but they would get reprimanded, right? Because they're not an official union. So what the league would do is they would have the students come out at 5 a.m. in the morning and leaflet to the union workers that are going into the factories, right? Because they're trying to organize. But you can't reprimand kids, right? In turn, the league allowed the students to use their resources to print this material, right? to put up posters in schools, to use their offices, so that the league understood that there was something that the students brought to the table. They believed in their ability to critically think. And I think that is something that, if we think about student activism today, that is what makes it work. If you look at Newark students, they have a community of parents that supports them. They have folks that are bringing them blankets. and. They have people that are helping them survive, not pushing them to think any kind of way, but just saying, hey, here are the tools, here are the resources, we support you. And I think that for me, that's the lesson that I've gotten out of doing this work. Yeah, I mean, I, so Todd Shaw has this really good book out called Now is the Time, and it's about welfare rights organizing in Detroit between the 1930s and the 1990s. And his argument is that black activism is effective when activists take into account utility, timing, and context, right? So for students today, they have to think about the militarization of police, right? Which is very different from some of the things that the students had to think about then. I mean, they did have police officers as security guards in their schools. And, and we could argue that this is, because of the student walkouts, we begin to see police officers in the schools in mass responding to that, not as a way to protect the students, but as a way to quell unrest. Um, so that they had very different interactions with the police state. And I think that students have to take these things into consideration. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, okay. The students that I'm talking about, they're definitely were tuffles. Sometimes we have to figure out, is this attributed to age? Is it because young people are likely to tussle and get into fights because by virtue of their youth? Is it because of race? I mean, these are the complicated questions we have to think about. Um, and I mean, when we, when we think about these kind of individual incidences, what does this tell us about a larger problem of race relations? One of the reasons I really like the Theo Harris piece is that she shows collaboration across movements. Um, I wish I would have had this clip of the 1968 movie because it's about the Chicano student activism. And I think that, in general, it depends on the space that you're in. I would expect to see a narrative about collaborative movements between black and Chicano students or black and your, um, Puerto Rican students in New York, in the story of New York. I would expect to see that in LA, in the story of New Mexico. Um, in Detroit, it's a little bit more complicated because a lot of the, the students who identified as Latino, um, they attended Catholic schools. And because I focus mo mostly on Detroit public schools, they don't really appear in the students' papers. So I have to do a kind of a separate search to see what students were talking about. Um, and not many people talk about white students who supported black and Chicano student activism which is something that I'm also starting to look at because Detroit is like 45 minutes from Ann Arbor, 
right? So I think the problem is that we think about space in this very like limited way as historians. And we're starting to think more about race, place, and space. And I think the more that we, we do that, we'll see more narratives that actually take into account collaborative organizing, like inter-ethnic um, collaborative organizing. No, I mean, I do think that's an important narrative, and that's why I'm starting to think about Chicanos. Because I, I think if I want to use this, if I want to create a usable past, right, a history that is not only accessible, but that we can, we can take bits and parts from I don't have a thing, but if you look at the Newark students, this is an integrated group of students, right? It's, um, they're definitely students who would identify as Latino, as um, African American, as white, that this isn't something that's just 21st century movement history, that this is something larger. Um, but no, I agree, I think that's something that as historians we have to think about, and I can't really tell you why besides the fact that we think in this very limited way about space. The clip I played from Cass was about her talking about having to get bus to Cooley, right? Um, so Detroit's major decentralization or desegregation case was Milliken, v. Bra Milliken versus Bradley. I think the governor was Milliken. And that this case was handed down in 1972. So we can place Detroit within that larger conversation by thinking about Milliken versus Bradley. Um, and that the state really had to step in and say, okay, we're gonna create regional boards. So community control was an afterthought. That's the, the resolution to that. Um, but I think in terms of the union, actually if I had, before we took this, the monitor down, I had a handwritten note. Um, sure, okay. You guys can try to read it. It's a handwritten note. It's written in cursive. It took me forever to transcribe it. But the note, it's from um, Helen Bowers, who was president of the, yeah, you can't, can't really see that. She was president of the Detroit Federation of Teachers. She was an African-American woman. And the note essentially says, we keep saying that children, by definition, are immature. Um, they are not adults. Newest style is to treat them as adults, pretend they are adults. And then she goes on to kind of say, you know, when I was young, um, it was, I remember this as exhilarating. I thought that revolution was going to happen. And she, of course, is talking about, she would probably have been young in, in the 1930s, right? So that she thinks the revolution, so she's, in a, in a way, the teachers union had their backs up against the wall because you had more African-American teachers coming into the schools because of the student walkouts, right? But you also had the Detroit Federation who essentially said administration is responding to these student demands, but they all but ignore us, right? So that there, there is this tension there within the teachers union, but between the union and the community, right? Because the community is talking about community control of schools. What does that mean in terms of hiring and firing when you're talking about mostly African, you, you essentially want African-American teachers in the schools. And for the kids, it was African-American teachers with a certain political outlook, right? It wasn't just about race, it was about what is your analysis, what is your understanding of African-American history? The students had an interesting perspective about black teachers and administrators. On the one hand, a lot of the teachers, a lot of the black teachers they had were pretty young. They're 24, 25. They come into the school system because the students are walking out in mass saying, hey, we want more black teachers. So a lot of these teachers just graduated from Wayne State University or U of M or Michigan State University. And they're the ones who bring African-American history into the classroom. They're the ones who teach the kids about Richard Wright. They're the ones who teach the kids about Zora Neale Hurston. So on the one hand, these, the teachers become kind of an agent of political socialization. They introduce the kids to African-American history in a way that they hadn't had access to before. On the other hand, um, because teachers did not have a certain political outlook that they may have identified as liberal, and at this time the kids are like, look, if you weren't about the revolution, we're not about you, right? And, and that's how they talked about these educators um, in their papers. And it was the question of, okay, we're gonna get rid of this one black administrator, but what's the point of getting another black administrator if they won't allow us to have say in the curriculum, if they won't allow us to have say in how many police officers show up 
in our schools as security guards. So it was a complicated relationship, I think, between the students and the black educators. Does that a part of her experience in transitioning from um, Highland Park to Detroit Public School, so there are a couple of things we can get from that. One is that the quality of education was very different. And the kids were talking about that, right? They're saying that you're tracking us in a way that doesn't prepare us to go on to college, where we have these surrounding areas of students who are learning German, not that they wanted to learn German, but that there was the option, right? So that there's a difference in quality of education. There's also a difference in the kinds of teachers. There are smaller classrooms, mm -hmm. right? So that there are different conditions that these teachers are working in. And I think to some degree that that, affect, that may have affected her relationship with teachers in Highland Park versus in um, Detroit Public Schools.